Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to our second season of CarmelCast. My name is Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese, and CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can go to icspublications.org. Today, for our episode, we are very happy to have with us Father Michael of the Heart of Jesus. He is our student master, formator uh, for us Carmelites. So welcome, Father Michael. Thank you, Father Michael Joseph. It's good to be here with you today, especially as we celebrate the feast of our sister St. Therese. Yes, yes, it's perfect. We're celebrating one of our greatest, the doctor, a doctor of the church, along with St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Jesus, St. Therese. And so today we thought we would have a, a conversation on her, and especially on, on her teaching on the little way and how important that is. So maybe we could just start out with a little information about, about you, Father Michael. What, what is, maybe you can give us a little bit about your own story, your own background. Well, uh, I've been with the order for about 20 years now and um, originally from New York, uh, but joined the community after I met them in Washington, D.C. And uh, I've always been drawn to the saints and to uh, drawn to prayer with the Lord, mm -hmm. kind of uh, hungering for kind of that, that interior life that, that so characterizes uh, Carmelite spirituality. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, I think that's a, a common denominator for, for us Carmelites, is that, that seeking of the Lord, that thirst. And all the more with St. Therese, who, who spoke so, so eloquently about the thirst of God, the thirst of Jesus for, for us, for our love. Um, could you maybe say a little bit about your own connection with St. Therese or how she has influenced your life? Yeah, I, I think um, long before I ever knew what a Carmelite was, my mother was already praying novenas to, to St. Therese uh, because of the reputation she had for interceding and, and answering uh, novena prayers with, with roses. Mm -hmm. And I would say in my own life, um, uh, I'm, I'm growing in my appreciation for uh, her example and her, her, uh, her message of, of living in deep faith. Um, the longer I live as a religious, the more I realize that the work of surrender is at the very core, uh, trust and confident trust uh, in, in the Lord Jesus. And Therese is a master at, at pointing the way to that abandonment and trust in the person of Jesus. Yes, yes. And what, what you're saying, that, that confidence, that trust, that abandonment, um, she, she had a term for that, you know, as a... As, as, as characteristic of, of her way, of her spirituality. Um, could you tell us about that term and, and what that means? The little way. We, uh, Therese refers to the little way as something that is new and, uh, and kind of coins this term referring to this way of living the gospel. And uh, we might say a little bit about what, how she came to find this little way and, and uh, what, what it consists of. I think uh, the first thing is Therese was uh, really uh, a woman who was filled with great, great desires. Uh, she came to Carmel, you know, she petitioned before Leo the Thirteenth to, to enter Carmel as early as 15, mm. you know, and uh, she was told to wait. But she was someone who from very early on felt that Jesus was calling her to give her her entire self to Jesus. And yet she realized that even while she had these powerful desires, she was unable. Um, she, she was helpless in her ability to, uh, to surrender herself and to give of herself in the way that she wanted to, because she felt her weakness, her um, uh, kind of her her disordered affections, mm -hmm. um, her fears, her anxieties that really uh, made it difficult for her to to give herself in the way that she wanted to. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds like it's something that we can all relate to, that aspect of St. Therese. She, she was not a stranger to our own interior struggles and, and our sense of helplessness at times or um, this constant temptation to discouragement that I think many people go through. Um, so can you say maybe what, what was it about that experience um, that helped her find the little way? What, what kind of, what was the springboard then to, to teach her the little way? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, aware of those desires she had to live in a holy way of life, but also aware of how she was kind of, you know, emotionally or, or uh, spiritually crippled almost by, by her anxieties and, and by her woundedness, she still believed more that, uh, that what God was inspiring within her heart was something that was attainable. Um, you know, as, as she would say, uh, looking at the story of a soul, she, sp- she writes about it uh, very plainly here um, in Manuscript C. She writes, You know, Mother, I have always wanted to be a saint. Alas, I have always noted that when I compared myself to the saints, there is between them and me the same difference that exists between a mountain whose summit is lost in the clouds and the obscure grain of sand trampled underfoot by passers-by. But she goes on to say, Instead of becoming discouraged, I said to myself, God cannot inspire unrealizable desires. I can then, in spite of my littleness, aspire to holiness. And Therese says, but I want to seek out a means of going to heaven by a little way, a way that is very straight, very short, and totally new. So she has an awareness of her great desire, uh, but uh, knows that left alone she can't attain it. Uh, and, um, and yet she believes that with the help of God's grace, uh, her desire can be fulfilled. Yes. This is kind of incredible too, because if you think about it, she is now the, one of the most popular saints of all time. She's a doctor of the church. Um, she is seen as, as one of the greats. And, and yet she felt that compared to the great saints, she was like a little grain of sand compared to a mountain. And so it just shows how her little way um, worked. I mean, how it, it God's grace produced in her what she had hoped for, what she hoped that and she knew she couldn't realize. Um, and so I guess my question is, was there something that inspired that in her to, to see that hope or to see, okay, how can I, what is my basis for this kind of radical yeah, trust? Yeah. Well, I mean, for one thing, we have to acknowledge that she was really precocious for her age. Um, she knew even at the age of 15, the depth of her own brokenness and her, her uh, helplessness in answering these desires she felt in her heart. Um, so what she did when she entered Carmel was she was always drawn to Scripture. She believed in uh, the power of Scripture, the centrality of Scripture, the, the Word of God in her life. Uh, interestingly, the nuns did not have access to the Old Testament in uh, in the Carmel, it was limited to what was read during Mass um, or within the office. But she, Therese, didn't have access to to the the whole of the Scriptures. When her sister Celine entered the Carmel years after Therese, Celine brought with her a notebook that contained uh, a whole number of scriptural passages that Celine had copied down mm. from the Old Testament. With that before her, Therese opened up Celine's notebook and came across uh, the first of two scriptural passages that were very significant for her in articulating this new path a little way. The first was Proverbs 9, uh, verse 4. And uh, that verse reads, uh, Whoever is very little, uh, let him come to me. And this is in Proverbs, uh, literally, uh, the Greek translation is whoever is very simple or naive. Mm -hmm. 
But the, the translation that was in uh, Celine's notebook was uh, the French translation of the Vulgate scriptures, which read, whoever is a very little one, um, let him come to me. And this immediately uh, spoke to Therese as one who felt helpless, one who felt very small in, in the face of the great desires she, she experienced. So that was the first uh, scriptural passage. She turned just a few more pages in this notebook of Celine and came across another from Isaiah 66, uh, which reads, As one whom a mother caresses, so will I comfort you. And you shall be carried at the breasts, um, upon the knees they shall ca caress you. And what really spoke to Therese again was the image of being an infant carried in the arms of God. Uh, that uh, in order to move, in order to go where she wanted to go, it didn't depend upon her efforts, her ability, her strength, but that God himself would carry her and lead her. Uh, to that end for which uh, God had called her. Yes, and it's, it's remarkable considering the context in which she was where there was a, an image of God often that prevailed as, as God just demanding, you know, that, that you fulfill this kind of life of virtue and then you'll be rewarded with eternal life. Um, and so that anxiety of Therese of not being able to reach those summits that, that she kind of expected or, or had a desire for, the answer she found was just being so small and, and that that was the effort, that she could just be so small that God would take her and this maternal face of God that prevailed over a kind of demanding, um, rigorous kind of image that, that we can all have, even in our day, that we can have parts of at least. So um, I think it, it just shows the, the genius of Therese and, the, and that inspiration she had. Um, to be able to do something new in a sense, even though, of course, it's not new, it's in the scripture, but, but for her, it was new. And maybe for her time, in a way, it was new. It uh, says something also about the role of scripture in Therese's life and mm -hmm. what that role is for us, too, that it's the living word, mm -hmm. that it's inexhaustible. So as each one of us, I think she exemplifies something for each one of us as one who turns first to the word of God, just as Jesus himself did, he who is the word, Remember when he was tempted by the enemy in, in the desert, rather than to respond um, ad hoc to the temptations of the enemy, he cites scripture as the basis for his answering. And so Therese looks for the wisdom or that path for her own life by turning to scripture. Yes, yes. And it's, it's, um, there's no end to it. There, it. You can just keep finding that renewal over and over as you turn to the scripture. And I think one of the the other aspects of her genius is that she had that scriptural knowledge and yet she was able to make it contemporary. She was able to make it um, applicable to herself and eventually to others. Um, could you maybe speak of some of those images that she came up with to illustrate this deeply scriptural um, inspiration that she had, but that made it maybe almost uh, a little more yeah, easy to follow for others? Yeah. Well, she had heard um, at the time that she was looking for her little way or trying to find an answer to these desires in her heart, she was aware uh, of, of the invention of the elevator in her time. In, uh, in Europe, uh, there began to be uh, examples of, of wealthy people who in their, their apartments or what have you had elevators, which was a very novel idea rather than taking the staircase. And she, this captured her, her, her uh, imagination, you know. Instead of climbing, she said, the rough stairway of perfection, she would look for this elevator, some kind of means that would immediately lead her to the realization of her desires. Um, and uh, so when she came across the scripture, uh, the scripture passages we mentioned, especially the one of being carried in the arms, she saw uh, here an example of the elevator, that by abandoning herself to Jesus and allowing himself, herself to be carried in his arms, uh, she could reach the height that left alone she couldn't reach. Mm. So the, the example of the elevator 
is, uh, is, is I think, uh, again, part of her cleverness of employing some contemporary image to uh, articulate her understanding and then also to help her teach it yes. to others. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the first is, is that elevator. The other image that I think is, is a, a powerful one, she mentions at the end of the story of a soul of manuscript C, she talks about uh, the notion of the fulcrum, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of, of uh, uh, Archimedes who says, you know, give me a, a lever and a fulcrum and I'll be able to lift the world. So the idea of this, uh, this uh, lever that one can push on, you know, with having a fulcrum in the center and be able to, to raise a much heavier uh, load. This is something I've discovered, unfortunately, too often on uh, picnic benches during the summer um, when I have very gingerly sought to sit with my brothers and sent them hurtling in the air when I've sat down. This is a demonstration of the, the fulcrum and the lever. <clears throat> but Therese saw this image, you know, she saw that, that uh, with her prayer and with the little love and the little acts of love that she would uh, she would uh, work that with God's help as the fulcrum, uh, there would be a tremendous efficacy to whatever she did, that whatever small thing she did would be magnified, you know, beyond our understanding because of, of, uh, of God's place in it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's another, another neat image there. Yeah, well, it reminds me too of a little bit of the background of that, of that image. Um, if you look at her notebooks, and you can see in her last manuscript as she's writing, um, towards the end when she was already very sick, she just kept going, but you can see her handwriting become shakier and shakier. And eventually she had to ask for a pencil because the pen was too hard for her. She had so little strength. And the pencil, you can see when it changes to pencil and then to such a light pencil, you can almost barely make out the letters. And that's when she's talking with such gusto about this image of the fulcrum, that she can do anything with God's help, that she can even lift the whole world by her prayer because it's God who's doing it. And I think it just speaks so much of her own living of that way, that it was at her weakest moment, you know, the, the most intense sufferings of her body and, and her spirit, um, that she was able to have such confidence in that image. Um, but we know she's not alone, right? She's part of a great tradition. Therese was, was a Carmelite first and foremost. And so um, maybe was, is there a background a little bit? Um, one of her, you know, forerunners in the Carmelite order that maybe helped her with this sense of doing little things, but with God's grace, it could lift the whole world. Well, certainly uh, our Holy Mother St. Teresa in the interior castle she, uh, she writes to her nuns in the Seventh Mansions that the Lord doesn't look so much at the greatness of our works, but at the love with which they are done. Mm -hmm. uh, that the importance is fidelity in the midst of the little opportunities that are given to us uh, versus being concerned about the significance of the actions we do or, uh, uh, or how great they appear to others in the world. Mm -hmm. That God sees things from a very different perspective. Um, he notes very carefully the, the small acts that are often not seen by our brothers and sisters. Uh, he sees them, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think, I think Holy Mother Teresa and, of course, John of the Cross, too, uh, were able to understand the efficacy of love, mm -hmm. that it consisted in, in giving all of what one has versus, you know, what might be appreciable on the level of, of the world or others even in the community. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, it's such a key thing to keep in mind that Therese was in a cloistered community. And um, as all this was manifesting itself, she lived, you know, in a very controlled, small community. Um, but even there, you can't escape that desire to be seen and to be known, to be appreciated, to be recognized. Um, and so we know that one of her greatest disciples um, was her own sister and that she struggled with this. And so maybe um, could you speak a little bit about that relationship and how Therese helped her maybe in this way? 
Yeah, well, it's extraordinary because we know in, in the Carmel and Lisieux, it was unique in the sense that there were four blood sisters, ultimately, who entered the, the, the monastery there. There was Pauline who first entered uh, and became, uh, you know, the, the prioress uh, as Mother Agnes, and then uh, Marie who entered, and then Therese who followed, and then uh, Therese's sister, with whom Therese was, was closest in age and, and perhaps more, most intimate, uh, Celine, stayed behind to care for Therese's father as, as he was ailing uh, outside of the monastery. But after uh, uh, Louis Martin had died, then Celine enters the monastery as well as the fourth sister. Uh, and what's interesting is that little Therese becomes the novice mistress of, uh, of Céline mm -hmm. and instructs Céline. Céline was uh, an artist. She was the one who took all the photographs of Therese and the community. And she was really, in some way, an impatient perfectionist. She saw, she had a, a great eye for things. She could see beauty and she expected a lot. Uh, of herself and consequently of others. And Therese saw in Celine really almost a twin spiritually. Even before they entered, they, they, they did a lot together. They shared their insights regarding God together. And Therese often thought of Celine almost as, a, as an other self, mm. you know. So Therese began to be the one who coached Celine in this insight she had regarding the little way. Uh, how to attain holiness with a greater efficacy. In the time that uh, the beatification process for St. Therese was taking place, they interviewed each of the sisters of the Carmel, and uh, they interviewed, of course, Celine. And Celine referred to various examples in her life of how Therese had coached her or taught her in this little way. Uh, in part of what she says, she comments on one example where she would frequently during her novitiate tell Therese how frustrated she was uh, because she didn't have lofty thoughts uh, like Therese's thoughts seemed to be, you know, or she would uh, struggle with her own pettiness, you know. And so one example she says is she had said to Therese how she... Uh, she said, you're always very nice to God and I am not. I would dearly love to be. Would my desire make up the leeway? And Therese says very astutely, yes, especially if you accept the humiliation of it and if you go a bit further and rejoice in it. That will please Jesus more than if you had never been lacking in attentiveness to him. Say, my God, I thank you for my not having even one nice thought about you. And I am glad to see that others do. Uh, an example, I think, this is where Therese tries to uh, emphasize that what's important is not Celine's efforts and not the power of her natural gifts to please God, but rather her reliance upon God, mm -hmm. upon him to do the heavy lifting um, and uh, rather to rejoice in her own poverty as, as something that is a, an opportunity for, for Jesus to carry her. Yes. You know. Yes. Well, it seems that's very applicable as well. I mean, you said that they, they lived in a convent, um, but we have the very similar struggles. I think any of us who are seeking a spiritual life at times um, get discouraged or at least tempted to be discouraged when we when we see these, what, what's written and these beautiful things that we see in the lives of the saints and, and then are just total, our minds on earthly things, on, on very you know, self-serving or egoistic, egotistical things. Um, and it's, it's very liberating to know that the very lack of a good thought um, can inspire me or push me to thank God and to kind of leave myself and bury myself in trust in God, that He, he will do the work. Um, but again, this is, this is very, it's, it's new in some sense, but it's also so scriptural. And, and could you say maybe a connection um, with this idea of Therese that Celine learned as her disciple, um, where we see that in the Gospels? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I think one of the just commenting on one of the hazards of being a Carmelite is, you know, our motto says, with zeal, I've been most zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And um, so we have this tendency to be zealous with regards to what we do. But uh, what we discover quickly in a religious life is we're here not because of what we can do for God, but we discover more and more that we've been called here out of God's mercy so that he can do for us what we are not able to do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think what's a great illustration of this action that Therese is trying to coach Celine with is found in, in Christ's parable of the vine and the branches mm -hmm. in John uh, 15, where he says to the disciples on the night before he dies, without me, you can do nothing. Uh, and this is an insight, I think, that is at the heart of the little way. Um, Therese understands this in her gut, but she doesn't uh, despair on account of it. She sees it as a tremendous hope. Mm. Christ states this is the reality. Without me, you can do nothing. Therese isn't then counseling uh, Celine just to abandon any effort to do good. But what, what Therese is trying to teach uh, Celine is instead to redirect her efforts, um, first clinging to Jesus as the source and the strength for whatever virtuous action she does. Mm -hmm. And this is a very different way of understanding what I'm doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing, is that, that clinging to Jesus. Uh, because as the Lord said, you know, that uh, without me, you can do nothing. That whoever remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Yeah. As you say, it's, it's not giving up. It's not giving up or, or saying, oh, I can't do anything. God will just do it. But it's, it's a really redirecting of your energy towards God with that, that trust that he will do it. But I'm giving my all to him. And, and first and foremost, I'm giving him my all to him and not to my own project, even how holy a project it might seem. And I think just all the more, it's more difficult for those of us who may be aware of natural gifts or natural mm -hmm. strengths, because ordinarily we are in the habit of relying upon these things. And part of the wisdom of the gospel is for us to employ these natural gifts without looking at them as the means of justifying ourselves before God. And this is where Therese, who was an incredibly gifted young woman, very intelligent, she learned that it wasn't those things that justified her in God's eyes, but rather her reliance upon the grace of Jesus in her own life. Yes. And could you maybe speak in a concrete way, uh, an illustration of that in her life, how she yeah. put that into practice? Well, there's, there's a really, an excellent example. I think this is, this is kind of good for us to... Um, to kind of demonstrate how Therese lived this little way in her own life. Uh, and it concerns the person of Sister uh, Teresa of St. Augustine in her community. And uh, in the story of a soul, Therese writes down regarding this sister. She says, this is in manuscript C, there is in the community a sister who has the faculty of displeasing me in everything, in her ways, her words, her character, everything. Everything seems very disagreeable to me, she writes. And still, she says, she is a holy religious who must be very pleasing to God. Not wishing to give in to the natural antipathy I was experiencing, I told myself that charity must not consist in feelings, but in works. She says, then I set myself to doing for this sister what I would do for the person I loved the most. Each time I met her and prayed to God for her, offering him all her virtues and merits. Therese writes, I felt this was pleasing to Jesus, for there is no artist who doesn't love to receive praise for his works. And Jesus, the artist of souls, is happy when we don't stop at the exterior but penetrating into the inner sanctuary where he chooses to dwell, we admire its beauty. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Therese uh, looks at this one sister that just causes everything in her to 
to flee. And uh, she, uh, on the natural level, would just want to avoid this sister at all costs. But for the love of Jesus, and uh, not fearing her weakness, she looks to Jesus as the means by which she can look charitably upon this sister. Um, And you can see from this passage that the little way isn't something that's just effortless, (laughs) but it requires a lot of work. You know, as my novice master said, Therese's is an adult spirituality. Uh, The digging into the other to look in charity for what is good. What is it that God sees in that person who on a natural level uh, repulses me? It it reminds you of what I've heard once about Therese when they said, someone said, um, the little way is, is making... Um, powerful choices in the face of strong emotions. And so often we're, we're captive by our emotions of antipathy, but with the grace of God that we can overcome that. I mean, she's proof that this sister, how did, she, how did the sister feel about her, yeah. do you think? Well, it's amazing because um, Sister Teresa of St. Augustine knew nothing about Therese's antipathy toward her. And in fact, she believed that Therese had a special uh, 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 favoring towards her um, and admired her. She considered herself an intimate of Therese. And again, here in in the manuscript C, she says that frequently they would work together during recreation. They would sit next to each other working on something. And uh, Therese says that, that this sister was absolutely unaware of my feelings for her and never did she suspect the motives for my conduct, and she remained convinced that her character was very pleasing to me. Uh, One day at recreation, Therese says, this sister, Teresa uh, of St. Augustine, asked in almost the same of these words, Would you tell me, Sister Therese of the Child Jesus, what attracts you so much toward me? Every time you look at me, I see you smile. And Therese says, Ah, What attracted me was Jesus hidden in the depths of her soul. Mm. Uh, Jesus who makes sweet what is most bitter. I answered to the sister that I was smiling because I was happy to see her. And then Therese writes in parentheses, it is understood that I did not add that this was from a spiritual standpoint. (laughs) So Therese is always a woman of truth. But her natural antipathy towards the sister in no way renders her a hypocrite in the fact that she does the work of charity because this is the will of Jesus, you know, and this is why Therese is such a great saint because she understands that her charity is not due to her natural inclination, it is the work of God within her, Yes, you know, and she reveals the glory of God, and she glorifies the Father precisely by continuing to love in the face of her own antipathy and her weakness. Yes, as you say, uh, many people would say, "Fake it till you make it," but this is <laughs> this is not faking it till you making it till you make it. This yeah. is this is choosing to love Jesus in spite of everything around us, and it's it's the little way, and it's it's the way that led her to be a saint and and many others in her path. Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalced Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.